Luke's Gospel. Open your Bibles or your pew Bibles to that place that Brian read from a moment ago, Luke chapter 2. Luke's Gospel is a masterpiece. Luke, a physician, carefully investigates. He interviews eyewitnesses. He wants to write an accurate account. He wants us to know that we can trust what he has written. And he begins his gospel with beautiful songs, beautiful music of Christmas. We've looked at the song of Zechariah in chapter 1. He sang about God's tender mercies through which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the path of peace. And we heard the song of Mary. She sang, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And we've listened to the song of the angels, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. It's after Jesus is born that we meet Simeon and Anna. Luke uses the same word in his description of both of them, for he describes their anticipation, waiting in expectation for the coming of the Messiah. The word that Luke uses literally means they were alert to his appearance and ready to welcome him. Alert to his appearance and ready to welcome him. Jewish law required that when a woman gave birth to a male child, on the eighth day, they would bring the child to be circumcised. And on the 40th day after his birth, the parents were to take the child to the temple and present the child to God. And they were to bring a sacrificial offering of consecration. And because Mary and Joseph were poor, they brought turtle doves instead of a lamb. But led by God's Holy Spirit, Simeon and Anna were at the temple. They were ready to meet Jesus. If you seek him, you will find him. If you seek him, you will find him. Over and over and over again, the scriptures tell us to seek the Lord, to seek his face, to earnestly seek him. God's power, God's wisdom, God's love, well, they are absolutely everywhere to be seen. They're displayed in countless ways. Yet, God has designed the universe in such a way that we can choose. If we choose to ignore Him and pretend that God does not exist so that we can do what we want, when we want to do it, and how we want to do it, we can pretend there is no God, or we can choose to earnestly seek Him. God wants us to seek Him. God wants us to reach out to Him. And He's made it possible. And if we will seek Him, we will find Him. Simeon and Anna lived in this anticipation. They wanted to see the one through whom God would bring salvation. You know, we love to view Christmas, and especially Christmas morning, through the eyes of a child because there's a sense of wonder and awe and excitement that children have that somehow we lose in adulthood. But here is Simeon and Anna. They are old. And yet, they have not lost their anticipation. For every moment of every day, they are waiting, they are watching, They are preparing for the coming of the Lord because they know that God will accomplish what He has set out to do. They know that God's love will succeed. They know that God's answer to hatred and cruelty is not more hatred and cruelty, but instead a tiny baby that love may reign For one day the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And now what they know by faith has come into sight. 
They see the one through whom God will save the world, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. Simeon takes the baby in his arms and begins to sing praises to God. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you promised in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. For Jesus truly is everything, everything that we need. Simeon's life is now complete. He has seen with his own eyes the salvation God's provide, the God will provide. And that's what he has longed for. That's what he needed. Christmas becomes a time of adoration and worship when we realize that Jesus Christ is everything, everything that we need. We need saving. We need saving. We need it more than the air we breathe. We need it more than food and water. We don't always say the right thing. We don't always do the right thing. And even at our best, there are chinks in our armor and flies in the ointment. And we can try harder and we can make resolutions. Ooh, it's time for that, isn't it? And we, and we can resolve we're just going to be better and better, but it doesn't work. We need saving. Our best is never good enough. And the more spiritual we are, <clears throat> the more holy we seek to become, the closer we get in our relationship to God, the more aware we become of our sinfulness and of our need for Him. Oh, we try to convince ourselves and everybody around us that we're okay, while all the while sinking deeper and deeper our efforts get more and more desperate. You know, lifeguards know that you shouldn't try to save someone who is trying to save themselves because what will happen? Well, they'll pull you down too, right? And when we're constantly trying to save ourselves, we pull down anybody that we can reach. Ezra said, Our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached the heavens. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We need a Savior. God saw our helpless condition and He sent Jesus. And Simeon has now seen with his eyes how God would meet his greatest need. He has seen his Savior. Mary and Joseph marveled at Simeon's words. And he blessed them. And then he turns to Mary and says the strangest thing. He says, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel to be a sign that will be spoken against. Simeon tells Mary that Jesus is going to bring out the best and the worst in people. That many will rise as they trust and follow Him and that many will fall away as they reject Him and turn away. We sang it a moment ago. The hopes and fears of all the years are met where? In Him. In Him. What you believe about Jesus, your relationship with Jesus, it affects all future events and actions. It calls for a response. In the Gospels, we see all kinds of reactions to Jesus. Some want Him to get away from them. Some want to kill him, but some fall down and worship him. Timothy Keller writes, If he is who he said he was, if he is who he said he is, 
then you have to center your whole life on him. And if he's not who he said he is, then he is someone to hate or run away from. But no other response makes sense. Either he is God or he isn't. So he's absolutely crazy or he's infinitely wonderful. There is no middle ground. You should either run away from him completely or you should devote all that you are and all that you have to him. He will cause the falling and rising of many to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the faults of many hearts will be revealed. And then he looks at Mary again and he says, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. What an awful thing to say to a new mother. A soul, a sword will pierce your own soul too. What is Simeon talking about? Well, we know, don't we? He's talking about the cross. He's talking about the cross. He's talking about the price that will have to be paid for his salvation, for your salvation, for my salvation. He knows that Mary will watch her son die, that she will watch as her son gives his very life for us. And if Mary's heart is broken, it did more than that to Jesus. For love and pain intertwine themselves the deeper the love, the deeper the pain, and multiply the pain of Mary as that sword pierces her heart and you get a glimpse of the pain of the Father. For He did not spare His own Son, but gave Him for us all. Experience the reality of that kind of love. Experience the reality of His love. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Because of love. Because of His love for you and me. He could have called 10,000 angels to deliver Him, but He doesn't. He could have miraculously come down from that cross. The nails would not have held Him, but He chose not to. His love held Him on the cross. Love for you and love for me. He could not save himself and save you too. It was the only way. That's how God demonstrated his great love for us. This is love. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that our great debt of sin might be forgiven, that we might have life, real life, abundant life, eternal life, that our broken relationship with the Father might be restored. God so loved the world. God so loved you. God so loved me that He gave His one and only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Like Simeon, we can look into the eyes of baby Jesus and see our Savior Christmas is an incredible celebration of the incredible love of God. Let the celebration continue. Let the celebration continue. Now, I know you're probably going to box up the ornaments and take down the tree at some point. Well, maybe. (laughs) Might just move it into another room or something. I don't know. And we'll move on January and February and March and April. And, you know, that's y'all have been there, right? That's kind of how things go. Christmas, you know, it has an expiration date, I guess. No, not really. Not the real Christmas. Not what we experience in our heart. Not the celebration of our Savior. Let the celebration continue. 
Let it change how you act. Let it change how you think. Let it change how you live. Let the celebration continue. Luke ends this part of the story with a summary statement. He tells us that Jesus grew and became strong and that he was filled with wisdom and that the grace of God was on him. Let the celebration continue growing strong in the grace and in the wisdom of our Savior. Live in His love. Realize each day that He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. For our relationship with Jesus changes everything. I received a Christmas card several years back that I treasure. I want to tell you the story about it. I was a new pastor in the community of Johnston. And I guess maybe my first or second Saturday there, I went to the local barber shop. Now, it was what you would expect in an even smaller town than Woodruff. Um, The barber was chewing tobacco. The men were gathered there as they did every Saturday to solve all the problems of the world. And as I walked into the barber shop, there was a man cussing, cussing, cussing. He barely even took a breath between cuss words. It was awful. And the barber, trying to intercede on his behalf, said in a very loud voice, Well, hello, reverend. But I don't think it slowed him down a bit. Later, I learned that that man was one of my church members. Although he had not been to church in eons, and he was known to be particularly mean-spirited, cruel and abusive. And in the next few months, I got to know some of the people he had horribly mistreated and abused that had been caught in his path of destruction. Well, a year or so later, I went fishing. But I wasn't paying attention, and I got my car stuck in the mud. And I got out and did all the things you try to do to get your car out of the mud, and nothing worked. And this was at a time when people, well, I didn't have a cell phone. Most people didn't have cell phones at that time. And I began to look around to figure out what I needed to do or could do next. And there was only one house within walking distance. Guess whose house? It was the man who had been cussing in the barber shop. So I stoked up my courage and I knocked on the door. And what happened next is really hard to explain. He used an old truck to push my car out of the mud. But something strange and wonderful happened to him that day. Somehow, God used that encounter in an absolutely miraculous way. It was as if the scales fell off his eyes and his heart was changed. That very day, he came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior and God changed him. And it was so exciting to see that change. And at 70-something years old, he became a new creation. So the Christmas card I wanted to tell you about, well, it was from him. And in his Christmas card, he gave thanks to God for all that God had done for him. And he noted that God's gifts last for all eternity. Through Jesus, we have eternal life. Through Jesus, there is more to come. Jesus came that we might have abundant life, and eternal life begins at the very moment that we commit our heart and life to Him. Let the celebration continue. Grow in the knowledge of our Savior. Grow in the grace of God. Grow in the peace and joy that this world doesn't know anything about but it comes when our hearts are surrendered fully to Him.
grow in your experience of His great love. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our fear and enter in. Be born in us today. Oh, we hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us. Abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. Amen.